Kia ora, both myself and Nadia will give the presentation today. Um, but just some context to begin with, we're part of a much larger team where we're using both quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, it's part of a funded program of research for the Health Research Council over the last three and a bit years, uh, as well as uh, funding from the Children and Families Research Fund uh, at MSD and the Health Promotion Agency as well. So it's part of a much bigger body of work. And so if there's any kind of additional questions, you know, feel free to uh, send, drop us a line later. And there may be things that uh, we've also done, but just not going to cover today. What we're going to focus on is three forms of healthcare service uptake, uh, which we've covered over this program, immunization, GP services, both the use and experience of GP services, um, and dental checks. But in saying that we're covering those three, we're primarily focusing more on immunization in part because uh, there's been, one, lots of interest in that space and uh, lots of uh, end users and stakeholders wanted to know, know more about that space. And that's also where a lot of the data was as well in terms of data availability. I'll go first and I'll go through some of the key findings from the quantitative work. Uh, and then Nadia will uh, talk through her beautiful results in the qualitative work uh, and then we'll join together uh, a little bit at the end to kind of talk through what are some of the practical and policy implications of these findings to kind of bring the academic work into a bit more of a reality lens. I think this motivation uh, slide here is probably, um, you know, known to everyone, but I'll just go through it anyway. Current policy indicates there should be equitable access by ethnicity for these three uh, types of healthcare services, at least in terms of direct costs. Okay, uh, We've got free doctor visits up to the age 14. We've got free vaccines under the national immunization schedule. And of course, free dental care uh, until year eight of school. But despite these free direct costs, uh, ethnic gaps we know persist particularly for Māori and Pacific peoples. And we also know that if there is underutilization of these services, then there's going to be future health risks. There's adverse health outcomes in the long run, and there's studies that have shown, for instance, that there's an increase in infectious disease hospitalizations as a result of delayed immunization uh, uptake. So some of the quantitative uh, work we've done um, I'll present two kind of studies we've done in this space. So in the first study, it's a decomposition analysis, and feel free to pose any questions if I use too much economics jargon. I should say, you know, we're from two different disciplines, but we've, uh, you know, that's the beauty of this work that we've managed to kind of complementary put together economics uh, and health and both quantitative and qualitative together to kind of uh, get some end results in terms of policy implications. Uh, excuse me, I should acknowledge my co-authors in the study. Uh, Terry ann Clark, Kabir Dasgupta, Sonia Luika, and Alexander Plum. And I should also acknowledge the children and families who are part of the Growing Up in New Zealand study, because we use that wonderful data, as Val May alluded to. So in this particular study, uh, our main aim was to try and understand exactly what are those ethnic differences in terms of life course trajectories. So not just at a particular point in time where we get data from one cross section, but what happens to that life course? What happens kind of antenatally when uh, there's a pregnancy? What are the kind of plans in terms of immunization? What happens at six weeks? What happens at a year? What happens at 15 months, two years, four years? And follow that life course trajectory. Uh, and then we wanted to not just examine the ethnic differences that change over that life course, but try and quantify what was the contribution of different factors. And does that change over the life course? You know, does some things that are more important at six weeks become less important later on and vice versa? So we use data from the Growing Up in New Zealand birth cohort study. So this is information on uh, more than 6,000 New Zealand children and their families. 
uh, and it surveys quite a broad range of information uh, about the child, about uh, the health uh, of the family, education of the parents, the neighborhood, the environment, as well as a lot of cultural questions and questions about identity. Uh, and we use for this particular study four data waves. There have been more since then that Growing Up has collected, but uh, at the time we did this work, there were four data waves. So antenatal uh, at nine months, two years, and four years old. Um, so those are DCW0124. Uh, and I just point that terminology out because you might see that in later slides. And here's just a kind of snapshot of a few of the outcomes of interest. Um, I haven't put them all in here. You can, uh, there's links at the end of the presentation to the actual uh, papers we've written, so you can uh, go and look at them. Uh, but here we've got a mixture of immunization variables, dental visit variables, as well as some around GP use, uh, such as uh, you know, use of as well as experience with. Uh, so for immunization, we've got uh, your antenatal intention to fully immunize, uh, whether you did all your first year immunizations for that child on time, and on time is within one month of the due date, um, uh, whether they received all their 15-month uh, immunizations. Um, for dental visits, we look at whether they've had a dental visit by age two and age four. And in uh, the space of doctor visits and GP use, et cetera, we look at whether you got your first choice for lead maternity carer, uh, as well as had you seen a GP or some health professional since you were pregnant, and then whether you were satisfied with your GP practice at the time the child was age nine months. And what's quite interesting, what we've highlighted here in orange is the lowest means. Uh, and we've done it by uh, three ethnicities here. There's more, uh, there's Asian as well in the report, uh, New Zealand, European, Maori and Pacific peoples. And what's interesting, particularly in the immunization space, is that New Zealand, European actually have the lowest intention to fully immunize, uh, so 75% relative to 82% for Māori and 94% for Pacific peoples. But when it comes to the actual immunization, uh, then Māori have the lowest all year, all first year immunizations on time and lowest 15 month immunizations on time. I should note uh, as context, so this is using growing up data and the time these children were these eight particular ages that we're covering is pre-COVID. Okay, uh, so a different context at that time. Um, dental visits, it's a mixture of Māori and Pacific peoples who uh, have the lowest dental visits. Uh, and for choice of LMC, uh, Pacifica have the least likelihood of getting their first choice of lead maternity carer. Uh, and Māori tend to have the lowest likelihood of being satisfied with their GP practice. And we know that satisfaction leads to less likelihood to uptake other healthcare services. Um, in terms of the explanatory data we used, uh, I've kind of put them into categories here. Uh, so for instance, we've got a, quite a wide range of mother and child characteristics, like whether it was the first child, uh, what was the mother's age, what was disability status, etc. And then we have a range of socioeconomic variables, which we know are very important, uh, like the employment status of the mother uh, and the father, if we had the data available, uh, educational attainment, household income, etc. Uh, for household, whether you are in a sole parent or whether you have a partner, uh, as an example. Uh, and then the last two categories are probably ones that are quite unique in some ways to the growing up survey and you don't tend to get in a lot of other surveys. Uh, so mobility, so transport availability, if you had access to personal transport, uh, as well as the number of times you'd moved residents um, in the last, I can't quite actually remember, in the last year or last three years. Um, as well as other social aspects. So one, 
whether you had perceived to be discriminated against uh, in the health system, whether you'd been discouraged from immunizing, and it was also broken down by who discouraged you, whether it was your family or friends, whether it was uh, health practitioners, whether it was media, et cetera, uh, and, and the flip side, whether you were encouraged to immunize. Um, so as you'll see soon, some of those social aspects were really important uh, in determining a healthcare service uptake. Very quickly, the method is a decomposition, which uh, we use the fairly decomposition, and all that does is it takes those covariates that I just described, uh, and then tries to work, uh, tries to quantify how they are associated with ethnic differences uh, in uptake of those various outcomes, whether it's immunization, dental care. Um, or the GP use and experience. Uh, and we do comparisons with New Zealand European. Um, the other thing it does, not just quantify how much each of those things matter, but it uh, also splits it up into how much of those differences can be explained by those covariates and how much is left unexplained, uh, which is quite important because that means there's something else we should be looking for if some some of the ethnic differences aren't explained by those variables that we just talked through. So if you want to look at all the tables and the numbers and the coefficients and marginal effects and all of those sort of things, yeah, have a look at the report. I've just put some of the key findings here uh, in the slide. Um, so I'll just go through a, a few of them. Um, so first off, uh, there's several household and individual predictors where the association is time variant. So what we mean here is that they, for instance, I'll use the example of socioeconomic status. It appears socioeconomic status is highly relevant for timely immunizations in the first year, but then it actually becomes statistically insignificant at later immunization events. Uh, so it shows that, you know, that there isn't a set, set of factors that necessarily impact each point in time that they change over the life course. Um, the second point is around, uh, again, timely immunization. And what we found that uh, a large proportion of the New Zealand European Maori gap in timely immunization was associated with household characteristics, such as single parent household or size of household. So what you can think about here is maybe there's, you know, with these kind of characteristics, you're juggling a lot of things uh, and getting to timely immunization events uh, becomes harder to do when you've got a lot more to juggle uh, as a single parent household or with many children in the household. Um, access to transport and less frequent residential movements were also linked to a number of the healthcare uh, uptake outcomes. Uh, as well as employment education, which often signals um, lack of choice potentially. Now, as I kind of alluded to earlier, social factors played a really key role, and it was the largest contributor to the New Zealand Māori difference in GP satisfaction at nine months, uh, particularly whether you were discouraged from immunization when you were pregnant, uh, and also on the flip side, whether you were encouraged. Um, and when we broke it down, if I remember correctly, it was discouragement from uh, family and friends that was uh, in terms of source. Uh, also important was whether you had uh, perceived to have ethnically motivated discrimination by a health professional. This lowered your likelihood of achieving your first choice uh, lead maternity carer, and it also reduced your satisfaction level with GPs. Um, there were some ethnic gaps in this analysis that couldn't be explained despite all these different variables we threw into the model, uh, which means there's more research to do in that space. Uh, and the two that uh, couldn't be or had high levels of unexplained were why Pacific mothers in particular were less likely to achieve their first choice uh, LMC and some of the dental outcomes uh, had a large proportion that was still unexplained uh, as to why there was lower uptake of dental visits by Māori and Pacific.
So that one was looking at a decomposition. In the next study, uh, in the quantitative space, uh, before I pass on to my uh, qualitative colleague, uh, we focused in on just immunization. And here my uh, co-authors are Kabir Disgupta and Alexander Plum. And what we really wanted to understand in this study, and it's a very short study, but I think really important, some interesting results from it, we wanted to understand the dependence levels. Essentially, how much does immunizing at a prior schedule influence your likelihood of vaccinating at the f following schedule? So, you know, what's that probability difference if you go to one immunization event? How much more likely are you to go to the next? Um, and for that, we use specifically the immunization data from the growing up study at six weeks, three months, five months, 15 months, and 48 months. So quite a few time points. Uh, and our method is this dynamic random effects probe model, which I won't go into, except to point out that there's many things that can influence your longitudinal pattern of immunizing. You know, it could be influenced by your first response. You know, your initial response to immunizing uh, is a key factor. Uh, it could also be influenced by just your general behavioral effect from one to the next. Uh, and it could also be just unobserved characteristics that constantly influence all immunization events. And what this particular model does is it tries to hone in on that second one. You know, it, it accounts for the initial response, it accounts for the unobserved characteristics, and we're trying to hone in on what's left over. What's the genuine behavioral effect of going to the immunization uh, appointment on your next immunization appointment? Very quickly, a transition matrix here, which shows, for instance, your past immunization on the um, left-hand side, and on the top, your current immunization. So for instance, if you didn't, if you said no in terms of you didn't immunize at the last event, at T minus one, then you were 71% of that group were also likely to not immunize at T, okay? Likewise, if I go to the kind of the bottom uh, right corner, if you did immunize, you were yes at T minus one, so yes at the last event, then 95% of that group were yes at the next event. So that kind of shows there is some dependence, there is some link between you know, what you did at the last event could influence your, your future behavior. This is just raw descriptives. Um, and here are the main results. Um, the tables like the other paper are in the paper. But the key result is that there's really strong state dependence in child immunization. So what that means is if you immunize at one event, you are 21 percentage points more likely to immunize at the next event. So going into one had a strong impact on your likelihood to go to the next one. And what I find also interesting here is this effect was exacerbated if you were actually discouraged from having your child immunized in the um, antenatal period. So if you were discouraged, but you somehow uh, some, uh, somehow went to an immunization event, that actually had a bigger dependence. So you were even more likely than 21 percentage points to go to following events. So getting the discouraged people uh, you know, <laughs> into the immunization schedule can have a big impact and it can have a lasting impact, a long-term impact. Um, and that similarly, that state dependence was also stronger for Māori. And this is where I then pass on and uh, to my colleague, Nadia, who's going to talk through some of the qualitative aspects of the study, and then we'll join together at the end. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you again for the opportunity to um, speak to you all today. Um, so as Gail mentioned, I'll be talking through some of the qualitative findings from this piece of research. Uh, so firstly, also wanted to acknowledge um, this wonderful qualitative team. So I'm presenting on behalf of them and also wanted to acknowledge all the participants that, um, you know, contributed their time and ideas for this project and the members of the advisory group that were really helpful as we 
kind of developed the study. So the research aim for this one was to explore the why behind the patterns that we were seeing. And I think it's actually really great that we bring qual and quant together because you'll kind of see some stories behind some of the numbers that Gail just went through. So um, in the study, we specifically wanted to look at the perceptions and experiences amongst ethnically diverse caregivers. Uh, so we used a qualitative description methodology, and it was informed by Kopapa Māori and Talanoa principles because um, we were really keen to ensure that the processes that we used in this research were culturally appropriate for Māori and Pacific. Um, so as I said, we focused on caregivers of um, young children, and we also focused on the same three um, health care services, so immunizations, GP visits, and dental checks. Uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews and focus groups, mostly around Northland and Auckland. And in terms of data analysis, we used the six phases of reflexive thematic analysis according to Brown and Clark. Um, what was really amazing about this project was our team was like linguistically and culturally matched as best as we could to the actual groups. Um, and we were hoped that this created a comfortable space for caregivers to really share their experiences with us. Uh, so we ended up uh, having 145 caregivers um, participate in this, which is amazing for a qualitative project. And what was even better was that we had overrepresentation from Māori. Um, so as you can see, there are 83 of our caregivers um, identified as being Māori. Most of them were female. And um, another interesting point, which I'll tie in with some of the results we'll talk about later, are about a third of them were born overseas. So we do have some interesting um, like experiences from a, mig like a migrant point of view. Um, among the, the caregivers that participated in this study, um, the majority were actually enrolled in GP services and were fully vaccinated. So despite our best efforts to get, you know, the hard to reach population, it does indicate that there's some form of engagement amongst the caregivers that we spoke to. But this we saw as a real strength because they were able to speak to their experiences um, when they accessed services for their children. So I'll go through the results. We ended up constructing five themes. So hierarchies of knowledge and trust, relation, relational versus transactional health encounters, bad mother vibe, the slow burn of waiting, and navigating complexity. And then in the next few slides, I'll spend a little bit more time kind of um, describing what each of these themes meant. So in terms of hierarchies of knowledge and trust, the caregivers talked about various sources um, that they went to for information and support, and um, they trusted these sources to varying degrees. Now, while they did talk about specifically amongst Asian and um, uh, backgrounds, that they did trust healthcare professionals and their points of view, it was really interesting that they talked a lot about how they had like instincts as their parents and they knew their child the best and they really wanted healthcare professionals to kind of work with them when they were coming up with a treatment plan for their child. They also talked about resorting to parents that were friends and other, you know, family members. And so we kind of call this like their informal parental like network. And these were really important sources of information for them. And in some cases, it influenced their health seeking behavior. So if they talked to friends and family and they were like, oh, don't worry about, you know, going to the doctors, then that could sometimes influence them seeking health care for their child. And as we can see here in the quote, they say there, the parent network provides you with more information sometimes than the midwife, experienced moms. So they really looked to people who had children already and they could speak from those experiences. Caregivers with Indian, Pacific, Chinese, and Māori, so basically non-European um, ethnic backgrounds, they talked about how they did look to traditional healers and medicines, particularly if their child was not in a critical condition. Um, and I just wanted to focus a little bit on Māori and particular because as I said we did have an overrepresentation of 
Māori in this sample. But it's also really important that we don't kind of group everyone in together. And there are colonial issues that come into play, and we really <coughs> found that in this study. So Māori caregivers were generally less trusting of healthcare professionals. And it was really interesting that they talked about using traditional knowledges and practices as a way to kind of reassure them and provide them comfort and provide a space for them to actively be involved in their child's care. And what was unfortunate is that, that in some cases, they were made to be criticized or feel ashamed about using these practices in tandem with Western practices. And so some Māori caregivers spoke of how they resisted this and they exerted their rangatiratanga or self-determination. And while this could be perceived as them being, you know, aggressive or resistant, they wanted those actions to be perceived as them being fierce kaitiaki or protectors of their children. And so we can see here in this amazing quote that I wouldn't let them operate until he signed. He would operate as if he was operating on his own child. I brought the whole operating team into her room and we did katakia. So our next um, theme really focused on the health care encounters. So caregivers often talked about how there was this very transactional nature of the health appointments. Um, but unfortunately, what caregivers wanted was an opportunity for whakafanangatanga. They wanted to build relationships um, with the healthcare professionals that they were seeing, especially because they were treating their children. Um, they talked about how they really wanted to have inviting health environments and kind healthcare professionals. It didn't matter per se that the healthcare professionals were linguistically and culturally matched. They just wanted them to be kind and respectful and competent. So those kind of um, factors trumped, in a sense, you know, having to be exactly matched to their culture and language. Um, as alluded to before, building relationships and that continuity of care was really important for these caregivers. And um, it was particularly important for mothers um, when they were postpartum. So one of the, some of the quotes here, it really shows that relationship that can be built and how strong that can be. So the, one of the Pacific caregivers said, you know, I would have lost my youngest son if it wasn't for her. So that really shows how strong that bond was. And a Pakeha caregiver went on to say, oh no, I'm alone now, when um, the midwife, you know, eventually leaves after the postpartum period. Um, in general, mothers felt neglected postpartum because a lot of the care then shifted to the newborn. And it felt like, once again, going back to that transactional, you know, health encounter, it kind of felt like a checklist. Like they just wanted, you know, to know that you were okay. And in a sense, it didn't really matter if you were not actually doing okay. They kind of just wanted to check through and kind of get the appointment over with. Um, and so creating those relationships, once again, is really important because the mothers or the caregivers might withhold information um, because it feels like it's just too transactional of an, of an encounter. Um, the next theme really focused on some of the judgment that uh, caregivers felt in these um, healthcare encounters. So a lot of the mothers really opened up about their struggles with motherhood. They talked about feeling overwhelmed and pressure and lots of guilt, especially if they were juggling lots of things at home. And in some of the healthcare encounters, they had a lot of judgment and fear of being labeled as a bad mother. And they felt pressure to conform to the exact recommended practices of the healthcare professionals and then felt very disappointed when maybe it didn't work out for them or it wasn't the best um, like option for them and their fano. So um, one of the, you know, Pakeha caregivers said, you know, when the lactation consultant called me um, and then I told her, you know, I had changed from breastfeeding to formula, I felt like I was disappointing her. Um, some of the caregivers also talked about some racist stereotypes, which, um, you know, Gail kind of also spoke to in the quantitative findings. So. Um, one of the Chinese caregivers talked about how, you know, the doctor talked to them as if you're Chinese and so you always just want to give your child medicine. Um, 
And once again, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time focusing on our Māori whānau. So um, they talked about a long history of Māori, Pepe and Tamariki being policed and, you know, really reflecting the historical and ongoing implications of colonization and the generational trauma faced by Māori whānau. Um, they described how vulnerable they felt when non-Māori healthcare professionals came into their homes and were, you know, interacting with their whānau. Um, and they talked about how it was part, you know, it was, they were so worried that if they were judged as being a bad mother that they might take their baby away. Um, and so, you know, one of the quotes here is saying, you know, I had a bad experience when I had my baby. I, you know, they said I looked really tired and I might harm my baby. And here we can see that means that the mother then, you know, stopped accessing care. And so this then has implications for um, her Pepe and Tamariki. Um, the next theme really focused on um, how slow <laughs> the healthcare system was um, for the caregivers. So they talked about really, really long times to wait for appointments and referrals and so on. And then paradoxically, the consultations would be very short. And I think this links in a little bit about um, the theme about trying to create relationships during these health encounters. And if they're really quick and short and very checkboxy, you know, we can kind of take away from that opportunity to build those trusting relationships. Um, importantly, parents really wanted to, to be understood that they were so emotionally distressed and they really wanted their child to be cared for as fast as possible because obviously you don't want to see your child in pain. Um, but what was really interesting is they were really aware of how overwhelmed the healthcare system was. And once again, sometimes this meant that they withheld information from the healthcare professionals because they didn't want to burden these professionals because they knew they were just so overworked. Um, so in one of the quotes here, an Indian caregiver says that, you know, my Plunkett nurse was my go-to. I would text her, I would call her. But then, you know, I would only really text her and call her if I really, 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 really had to. Um, some of the caregivers also then talked about having limited options for care. And um, what was interesting is this kind of was internalized as them feeling like they had to feel grateful for at least having some sort of care. So whether it was suboptimal or, you know, didn't meet their expectations or was really fast, the consultation, it, they should just be so grateful. Um, and they really didn't want to be perceived as that because they really felt like once again that they just were advocating for proper care for their child. Um, and the last theme that I'll go through is navigating complexity. Um, so caregivers found the health system quite difficult to navigate for their children. And they found that there were these certain gatekeepers to care. For example, sometimes, you know, a receptionist could be the gatekeeper to book, you know, doctor's appointments. Um, for some of our migrant mothers, um, filling out paperwork could be particularly um, horrendous, especially if your child is, you know, sick and needing, you know, emergency care. Um, caregivers from all of the ethnic backgrounds, particularly those from migrant backgrounds, um, expressed a lack of awareness about what services and support were available to them. For instance, the concept of a midwife was not necessarily, you know, that dominant in their countries of origins. So when they came to New Zealand and had to get a midwife, the whole process was very overwhelming for them. Um, participants also talked a lot about transportation costs and language barriers, which I think also resonates with, you know, how we talked, like Gail talked about those direct costs, but you know, there are some of these indirect costs um, in terms of transportation and taking time off work that were at play. Um, and importantly, what I wanted to talk about here was that uh, caregivers really talked about how assertive and proactive they had to be to access care for their children. Um, and sometimes this could once again make them be perceived as being aggressive or obstructive or difficult, which they didn't want to be judged as. But for them, they really felt like they were just being fierce protectors for their children. And they really just wanted to advocate for the proper care for their kids. Um, one of the Pakeha caregivers um, used the dental checks as an example of where she, you know, she had to call and call and say, can you see my son? Can you see my son? Can you, you know, can we book an appointment? And then, you know, went to the appointment and unfortunately, 
you know, the caregiver felt like they didn't quite get the care that she thought she was going to receive and just kind of sent her on her way. So I just wanted to go through a couple of, um, I guess, ideas as to what um, some of these results might mean. So I think in terms of having zero free policies, all of the caregivers were just so grateful to have, um, you know, in a sense, free access to health care for their child. It did reduce financial barriers. Literature has talked about this, so that's a given. But we did see a lot of other barriers and indirect costs to accessing health care that can impact um, child development and health like across their lifespan. And so we've just listed some of them um, here. The other point I wanted to just bring up, as I said, um, over half of our participants did come from migrant backgrounds. And it was apparent that migrant families had some of these unmet health needs. Um, so in, in terms of long wait times, you know, difficulty to navigate, limited support postpartum, and practices um, that eroded their trust in healthcare professionals. Now this was really interesting because we can see these transnational ties of their expectations of postpartum care and early childhood care that are present in their countries of origin versus what happens here in New Zealand. For example, in Indian culture, it's very common to have a lot of extended family and a lot of support for a mother postpartum. But if you're living away from your family and it's a completely different system here and cultural differences here, um, that support is not necessarily available for mothers postpartum. Um, so they did often compare the health systems. Now what was so interesting, and we kind of talked about this in the results, is just how amazingly assertive and proactive these mothers are. So some of the Asian mothers talked about how they par they use the health systems in parallel to their advantage for themselves for their children's care. So they would access traditional um, you know medicines. They would bring them back home if they were going home and they needed some dental work done. They would do it back home. And so that's really fascinating that they are you know leveraging both of these health systems. Um, and I think that also goes to how the health systems, particularly in Asia, um, India and China, are set up more private based. Um, so uh, we talked about, you know, the importance of building relationships and improving those health encounters. So they didn't want, you know, tick box exercises. They wanted to build these trusting relationships. But on the other hand, they also knew how burdened healthcare professionals were. So um, although the importance was it just wasn't necessary that they were the same ethnic background, you know, or shared the values, just that they respected them and they were kind and competent. Um, and this was particularly important for mothers postpartum so that they receive the support and that, you know, can kind of transfer into further engagement with the healthcare system for their children. Um, they also wanted to be seen as shared decision makers in the treatment plans for their children. So they wanted more autonomy, um, you know, and more, yeah, basically more decision making power in those relationships with the healthcare professionals and hopefully a little bit less judgment from the system and providers. As I said, there was a lot of talk amongst Māori um, about those, that ongoing colonial trauma that they're um, faced with and how our health system, um, yeah, it needs to do better. <laughs> and, um, you know, that fear of the children being taken away from them was really front and center if they didn't conform to Western ideals of parenting. Um, so the pressure to conform and the systemic racism present in the health system was very apparent. and. Um, we could see now that care, like the caregivers, they wanted to exert their mana, their power, their control, and they wanted what was best for their children. And so hopefully with time, and you know, hopefully the new health care reforms will be a great opportunity to um, better weave in some of these indigenous um, health care models into our system. So I will take you through some policy and practice implications before um, passing it over to Gail for a couple as well. Um, so overall, uh, additional policies and strategies we think would be helpful to reduce some of those indirect costs of accessing health services for children. Um, and we were particularly interested for the migrant children that uh, having to pay did seem like a barrier to that. So, you know, for immunizations, they're free for all children, regardless of your citizenship or migration status. That might be something we can consider. That's just one idea, you know, for, for all children. And the second point uh, is about around developing trusting relationships and delivery of culturally safe care. And, um, you know, there was, even though I presented two studies, there were a com couple of common themes that came through and then also matched 
the qualitative, which is interesting also I should point out because um, our quantitative data is based on children who were growing up from 2009 onwards, so when they were measured at uh, four years old, it was 2013, whereas the qualitative data was collected 2019, 2020. But yet, over that time span, there were still a lot of similarities um, over that period. Um, and uh, one thing that came through was the importance of encouragement from a range of networks in both the quant and the qual. Uh, in the quantitative, it, you know, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it came through that the most important was in encouragement by family and friends. And what I didn't mention earlier is that second most important was encouragement um, from uh, health professionals. Uh, so those sources of encouragement are, you know, really the flip side to the sources of discouragement that also happen uh, through a range of networks and uh, increasingly through social media, etc., uh, in the antenatal period. Uh, both studies also found the importance of addressing systemic racism uh, and where that may uh, come into play uh, potentially in the healthcare system as well. So just at the end there, I just wanted to highlight once again um, uh, the, that there's an opportunity to provide better support for mothers postpartum and that this is particularly important not only to create those relationships but so that um, it doesn't negatively influence their health seeking behavior. We don't want them to be quiet, be silenced, and stop accessing care. We want them to be super engaged. Um, and also taking, you know, going to the other point, uh, um, taking a more phono-centered approach will be really helpful. Um, and then lastly, uh, they talk so much about, you know, the health system being really complex to navigate and, and fragmented and very bureaucratic. And so there's an area of opportunity to improve the navigation of the health system and bridge these you know, various amazing support, you know, services that are offered. And, um, you know, some of that can be, you know, things that we can do, you know, kind of structurally. Um, but then because we found some of the migrant parents were particularly, you know, found it a bit challenging to navigate our system. Um, there's been other countries that have, you know, orientation sessions for migrant populations as to how to navigate the system, particularly if you're having a child. Um, and so something like that might be helpful and also better access to interpreter services would be helpful to help overcome some of those language barriers. Um, so I think that's all from us, but we do have a list here of all of our <laughs> references so we can hopefully provide those yeah. to anyone who's and, interested. And you should be able to receive the slides as well online. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you.